do you get a little nervous when you have to go back out in public again? When you can go to the conference, you can go to the restaurant, when you're in a crowd or you can go to a party. Okay. Well, true confessions. I'm an introvert. Yep. I talk on stage. Yeah, I've spoken in front of huge auditoriums of students, and I love that. And I love teaching to large groups, whether it's fitness or otherwise. But I recharge my batteries alone. So the pandemic for me was somewhat soothing. And now, whether like me or just because we're not used to it, it's new to be among tons of people again. It could be a little uncomfortable. So whether that might resonate with you or you potentially have always had anxiety, the title of the show may have grabbed you. And my guests today were oh so much fun. So just so that you know, behind the scenes, we actually had video on so we could see each other when there's a threesome. We try to be a little bit more careful. We're not stepping on each other's words. And it was so great to get to know them. But this is also perfect timing. So we are approaching the anniversary of the pandemic and when it all started. And can you believe it's been now 24 months, two years? But I thought it so appropriate to have them on. And then they have an awesome story. And I think so many of us will resonate. They talked about being college friends in the 80s. Anybody? Yep. (laughs) And we talked about a lot of things, both related to anxiety overall, to their story and how they got started. I mean, who, who would have wanted to own a title like the Anxiety Sisters? I asked them that, and it's a great answer. But I also relate it to the pandemic and what's happening literally right now for you hopefully ask the questions that you hope that I would ask. So get ready for this one. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns. And most of all, I hope to inspire you and give you greater expectations for the way we can all age so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. Usually it's all about how to move, what to eat, or mindset. And today it's probably more mindset and really looking at what's true for you. This episode, before we dive in, is brought to you by the Flipping 50 Five Day Flip. What is that? Well, if you just need to stick that toe in the water and convince yourself that yes, you can, in 15 minutes a day, I'm going to send you five exercise videos in a row. And at the end of the week, you'll be able to say, yes, I can. Yes, I did. And hopefully you'll be ready for more. All right, let's dive in. My guests today, and yes, that was plural. I did not stutter are Abby Greenberg and Maggie Sarachek. They are trained counselors, mental health advocates, researchers, educators, writers, and longtime anxiety sufferers. In 2017, they launched their online community, which now includes more than 200,000 people in over 200 countries and territories. Together, the Anxiety Sisters write an award-winning blog and host a monthly podcast called The Spin Cycle. Having learned to live happily with anxiety, they spend their time coaching anxiety sufferers and conducting workshops and retreats all over the U.S. Their new book, The Anxiety Sisters Survival Guide, was published by Pingdom Penguin, excuse me, Random House in September 2021. And I have to say that had to have been perfect timing. Anxiety, (laughs) anyone? (laughs) There's a lot of anxiety out there. Yes. The the pandemic definitely gave us a boost. Welcome (sighs) to both of you. Thank you, first of all, for being here. And I have to ask the obvious question or not. So I'm looking at both of you and actually I can see some coincidence. Are you really sisters? Not so much. Okay. Just more soul sisters. Is that our theme here? Yes. Yes. We say we're soul sisters. And that the only thing is we do fight like real sisters at times, but we are really soul sisters and best friends and, you know, have a very deep connection. 
Okay. And I have to ask, so where did that connection happen in a therapy group or wh- where yeah. do two women <laughs> in midlife with both with anxiety meet up? Well, we actually met up in college. Um, so we, we sort of, I guess Abby always says like we recognize panic uh, expressions on each other's faces, but really we met we met in college, and you know we were both struggling with anxiety, but we did not have the vocabulary for it. We didn't kind of know what was happening, or even to call it anxiety. Um, and we really stayed each other's touchstones once we graduated from college, um, as we went on this sort of adult journey, trying to figure out what was going on or young adult journey. So I say we spent quite a while going to IS, you know, probably our 20s and some of our 30s going to IS. We went to the therapist, the nutritionist, the past life regressionist, the neurologist, the gastroenterologist, whoever, whatever IS would take our money, we were there Um, because we were having all these symptoms, both of us, and they were different Mm -hmm. for each one of us, but we're having all these symptoms and we, we could not figure out sort of where they were coming from. Cause it, even when someone said to us, maybe this is anxiety or you're having anxiety, it seemed like anxiety. How could anxiety make it so I can't eat anything? Or, you know, how can I have the bear aspirin commercial uh, kind of symptoms um, from anxiety. How can I feel like I'm having a heart attack? So it it just didn't make any sense to us at the time that we were having that this could be anxiety. So um, it was really kind of our friendship that grounded us during that time and helped us start to make sense of what was going on with each other. Wow. Okay. So Abby, I have to hear from you. Is that the way it really rolled? I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> uh, yes, we did meet in college and we were kindred spirits. Um, I, I remember though, you know, for, for our listeners who, who may have felt some of the same things in the eighties, which is when we met, you know, there wasn't that the emphasis on mental health that we are fortunate enough to have now. And, and of course, Mags and I feel like it needs to still be much, much better. And that's what our mission is, is to make the conversation even more mainstream and make the experience of anxiety and depression and other mental illnesses even more or even less stigmatized. Um, but when we were in college, people didn't talk about anxiety and depression. Mm-mm. So we really bonded over having a lot of these symptoms that we didn't know what they were. We figured that we'd probably die from them at okay. some point. So I have to ask, because I, I find this very common theme, and I think it's across all industries or majors, if you will, or what we choose for our career, we we generally have some personal investment in it, whether it's interest or it's background. And, and often if something is going on, I chose sports psychology, right, too. So I totally get it. I'm right there. I must have been messed up and um, chose to figure out why. But I mean, was that a piece of, were you both in school on purpose for that? And so having changed majors, that's generally, you know, X amount of time someone will, did you start out setting out to be a counselor or something else? Was it, did your careers evolve into it or were you always, that's where I want to go? I mean, I, I ultimately went to social work school. Um, I had worked even in high school. I, I sort of had that interest in not not for profit and policy kind of interest. So um, I was kind of sitting in that direction. And I, my mother was a social worker, um, so I was kind of sitting in that direction. But I have to say that um, going to social work school and a lot of the activities around it definitely helped me to um, speak about and understand in a deeper way sort of what was going on and, um, you know, connect to some of the research going on. And then there was sort of all this, there was always all this great research going on about, you know, mental health interventions and this and that. And then there's like the reality of what happens in the real world. And the two often don't meet enough. So as a social worker, I was able to start to think about how we would bridge that gap 
So it, it added a lot, but I think that's sort of where my orientation has always been. What about you, Abs? That's a good question. That's a very good question. That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I have always my whole life, you know, people say, I, my family says I started talking at nine months old and I haven't stopped. <laughs> and I think that that's probably true. Uh, I've always been fascinated with how talk works. So even as an undergraduate in college, I was a communication major um, and I really was fascinated, you know, it, it, the research in um, how human beings create experience through words and language. And that's always fascinated me. And then when I started having all these mental health struggles, I definitely wanted to find a place to marry those two interests because, you know, Mags and I were spending so much time investigating in what interventions there were for anxiety and depression out there that we felt like it would be a crying shame if we didn't take everything we learned from that experience and incorporate it into our professional lives. So for me, um, I went back and did my graduate work in communication. I was focused on a lot about self-talk. And the research that I did was a lot about self-talk and how the way we frame our experiences to ourselves in our own minds and out of our own mouths, how that affects the experience. And it turned into, um, it, it sort of bridged into this study of how people can talk to themselves to get them out of that fight, flight, or freeze response and back into the parasympathetic rest and digest response. So, and then I became a professor and I was, I, I was a professor communication professor for, you know, 25 years before I stopped to do this full time. Wow. Okay. So there's really, that's quite a backlog. <laughs> I, I want to ask this because I love your name, right? <laughs> and um, first of all, it piques curiosity, which I think is always good in a name, but not everybody would want to be known as the Anxiety Sisters. I mean, where was that title born or what was the moment that you decided this is who we are. It happened on a bus ride. <laughs> of course it did. It did. We were we were on a bus. Sober and- or not? <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. Yes. We were we were on a bus. It wasn't very very well air conditioned. I do remember it was kind of a stinky bus. But so we were on this bus from New Jersey to Manhattan and we were talking quite loudly about the side effects of the anti-anxiety medication we were both taking. And we tend to talk loudly about things that most people whisper about. So people in the seat in front of us turned around and said, oh, I'm on that same medication. What do you do about that? And within a few minutes, the entire bus was involved in this conversation. We were all sharing what medications we were on, the side effects, how we managed them, how we managed our anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. We got off the bus and I turned around to Maggie and I said, can you believe how willing perfect strangers were to discuss something so personal as anxiety and, and, and mental health and medication. And Maggie said, yeah, I get it because anxiety is such a lonely and isolating disorder. People are dying to talk about it. They're dying to find other people to share that experience with. Okay. So I have a question. Is it maybe not easier to talk to a stranger about that? than it is to somebody close? That's a great question. What a good question. Um, Yeah, I think a lot of times it's easier to talk to a stranger about things like symptoms or medication for many, many people um, because there's still that stigma and that blame and that shame. And you know, it's kind of like when, when someone tells you their life story when you're on an airplane next to them or something, it's, there's this, this, I can tell, I can talk, but I'm sort of anonymous too, right? Mm -hmm. Like this person's Mm -hmm. not going to really remember what I look like or who I am. And so, yeah, that's such Mm -hmm. a good, that's such an interesting question. I never had thought about that one. And I think think that also has a lot to do with, you know, the fact that the internet has so taken over everyone's lives, that experience of being anonymous on the internet it, I think is the source of a lot of sort of the bullying and some of those and, and, and people saying things that they would never say to someone in person or if anyone knew who they were necessarily. I mean, I think there's a certain freedom in communication when we're not looking into anyone's eyes. You use this term. And so I'm wondering if this is kind of related. So spin cycle and you use something called a spin kit. Mm-hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? We we like to rename things. 
Um, <laughs> primarily because a lot of the clinical terminology is, is, is frightening. Um, you know, the word, when, when Mags and I hear the word panic, we think it's a command. <laughs> so, so, so for us, we wanted to come up with sort of a kinder, gentler way of discussing the experience. You know, part of what Mags and I do on a daily basis is demystify the experience of anxiety itself. What does it feel like to have anxiety in all of its wonderful, delightful forms? And so you know, we try to use really good metaphors that people can understand. So we like to say that we're going out for a spin or we're spinning when we're experiencing anxiety because it's very, you know, the experience of anxiety is very disorienting. And when we, our, our podcast is called The Spin Cycle because we feel like if you've had a panic attack, it feels like you've been in the spin cycle in your washing machine. <laughs> you know, it's the same exact thing. You feel like you're going to die. You're drenched. You're exhausted. Your heart is racing. You might be nauseated. It, it, it's very similar experience. So we call anxiety and panic spinning and we call our first aid kit for anxiety a spin kit. Okay, so I want to ask you something, and this just kind of struck me out of the blue. This may be maybe not such a great question, but a strange one. Is there an upside to being someone who has anxiety? Is there an upside, like energy wise or thought, mind, the way you work? So, what we say is anxiety is just, it's a human emotion right? It's like we all have it and it's very, very important to have it um, uh, in certain ways because without it, we would never get up off the couch, right? No I mean, judgment. no judgment. Been there, <laughs> Been there done that. But, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I always tell the story that Abby and I were doing a workshop once and, and, an, and a wonderful woman who was, who was quite a bit older said, it was in Vermont, she said, I was driving here and my car kept spinning out and I didn't feel anxious at all. And, you know, I looked at Abby and I said, well, she shouldn't be driving because that should have made her very anxious. It was a very snowy time in Vermont. So, but really that anxiety, it really actually keeps us safe, you know, because it's our brain telling us like you're, you need to do, you need to get this done or you need to be careful here. So when it becomes destructive is when it starts to, um, when the anxiety starts to decide where we go, who we see, what we do, something we call shrinking world syndrome, but it it's this idea that the anxiety is really taking over so that instead of being one factor in how we live our lives, it is sort of the biggest factor in how we live our lives. And there's a lot of things we just stop doing. And Abby and I both experience that, definitely. Okay, so say more about shrinking world syndrome and and then let's relate that back to everybody's world shrank and then it expanded in an mm-hmm. odd way to strangers. Like <laughs> um it, it's been a weird ride and and we're coming up on the 2 year anniversary which is very appropriate time for talking to you. <laughs> but let's let's go back. Shrinking world syndrome. What is it? I think shrinking world syndrome is something that happens um, with, pretend there's no pandemic and you still couldn't leave your house, but not just not leave your house, but um, shrinking world syndrome is really when we get afraid of having anxiety so that we really stop you know, going places or doing things. So it might be like, oh, I had anxiety, you know, at the mall or at the dentist or someplace else. So I'm going to avoid those places, right? So we, that often is starting out. And it could be panic. It could just be like a lot of anxiety or it even could be OCD symptoms. But I've had this, I've had this intensely uncomfortable experience. And I don't want to repeat it. My brain wants to keep me safe, right? I don't want to repeat that experience. So I'll just, you know, maybe we won't go on that vacation. You know, maybe we'll just, we'll have a staycation, which I have many staycations and I definitely believe in them, but it's not because you've chosen or that, you know, that you've chosen to stay home. It's that the fear, the anxiety of say planning a vacation or going to the doctor or going to the mall or whatever it is, feels so overwhelming that it's easier not to. 
Mm. And, you know, and so it starts out, like you say, at about one place or another place. And pretty quickly, um, those kind of feelings can take over. Okay. So. And your world shrinks, you yeah. know, a lot. During the pandemic, then what? Yes. Well, I mean, during the pandemic, um, I think it was appropriate for our world. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was keeping us safe. Yeah. Right. You yeah. Know, of course. Especially of course. before vaccinations and before we had good therapeutics, you know, it was a very scary time because there was this disease that was killing a lot of people. So, mm -hmm. uh, the anxiety that we all experienced around that was very protective and, and the, and, and that's how anxiety is supposed to work. It's supposed to keep you following public health guidelines and doing mm -hmm. the things that you can to keep yourself healthy and safe. What, what's become problematic is that now we're in a different phase. So, you know, now we have these vaccinations, we have these great therapeutics. For most of us, you know, COVID is not going to be a death sentence for most of us. So what we have to do now is find a way to pull back some of that anxiety that had us terrified to leave our homes and say, okay, now I have to start to grow my world back again while still taking into account public health guidelines and still keeping myself safe and keeping my family safe. But, you know, we don't want our worlds to stay as tiny as they were for 2020 and part of 2021. So it's, it's a real balancing act. And we saw our, our sisterhood um, almost doubled in size during the pandemic because, you know, people were very lonely and isolated and very anxious and, and we get it. We felt those things too. Are there traveling anxiety pants? No. <laughs> yes, they're called yoga pants. Okay. <laughs> okay. There are, there are, yes, there, there's definitely an anxiety wardrobe. Yes. yes. What What about the anxiety that's coming on now from some of us who? I'm an introvert. I can. Mm. I love to stand on stage. I love to work with groups, and yet I recharge alone, and I have loved it. Like it's canceled, and I don't have to have an excuse not to go. <laughs> you and Maggie, you and Maggie should be yeah. kindred spirits. <laughs> but I also know that there's a whole group of people out there that are anxious about reemerging and going back out into public situations when they haven't been. Because it's like being that kindergartner let into a room uh, near the new kid. What about that? So is that the, is that the reverse of shrinking world syndrome? You ask such good questions. Let me say, um, you really do. But um, so I am. A, I am a. I am like you. I tend toward introversion, which which really does mean that I get my energy from sort of being alone. And I like to say when it was time to leave our houses. You know, Abby said, I'm coming to Columbus and I'm going to be pulling you out of the house, literally. And that is what happened um, because I was perfectly content when we were when I was home, perfectly content. Um, I was complaining constantly about how yes. lonely I was and how much I missed the world because I'm an extrovert and how much I missed the world of people and things and wanted to be out and about. And Mags would say to me, I'm reading this great book. I'm so happy. <laughs> I can I can wander around my house. I can do do whatever I want. So, um, but yeah, so it is. It's a complex. It's very complicated because, you know, obviously we our brain got habituated. For those of us who tend to like being home, our brain got very habituated to this is safe. This is what safety looks like, because it really was at one point what safety looked like, and so now we sort of. Those of us that tend toward liking being home, we tend toward that. Um, we sort of have to push ourselves now to getting out and being out and about a little more. And definitely for people who have suffered agoraphobia, which I had in the past. Um, Do you want to define who, that? Oh, I'm sorry. Listeners? So agoraphobia, um, sometimes people think of it as fear of going out, but it's really not. It's fear of what happens when you go out. So it's fear of having panic or illness or something, and you can't get back to your safe space, mm -hmm. which is home usually. So, you know, people who've had agoraphobia are definitely, even people who've worked on it a lot, are seeing some things come back, like a reemergence of that issue. So it, it really is like, I have been very conscious with myself um, 
about sort of setting things up so that I have to go out more and more, you know, so it's really sort of exposure therapy. And it, it's been tricky because it's hard to figure out what the line is, you know, safety mm. and getting out. And, you know, we're, we're all trying to figure that out. There's no golden answer here. Well, and that leads me to um, social connection. So, Abby, mm. I'm guessing you're going to jump all over this one, but I could be wrong. <laughs> How does that relate to our our mental health? You know, and what collectively is there anything in and maybe not that you can say about us, like as a population, because of the pandemic and the lack of social connection, or mm-hmm. at least at the way we knew it. What oh, happened to absolutely. us? Absolutely, another great question. Yeah. Um, human beings are a social species, right? Uh, we're social animals. We have mirror neurons which are designed to help us read other people and imitate them. And if you want to see how mirror neurons work, just smile at someone. They'll immediately start smiling back. I just smiled at you and you just started smiling back. That's your mirror neurons at work. We have these because we are social and we are supposed to be reading each other. So when you take away the social experience, when you isolate human beings, it has terrible effects on us. You know, Harry Harlow the famous and controversial psychologist uh, who, who was a researcher at University of Wisconsin at Madison, his famous line was, a lone monkey is a dead monkey. And we talk about that in our book because the truth is, and he did these horrible experiments with monkeys, which then started the movement of you know anti-animal cruelty during experimentation. So there's a lot about him that's not to be liked. But what he did was he isolated monkeys for six months at a time. He took these neurotypical, happy-go-lucky, affectionate monkeys and locked them up in cages by themselves for six months. And then when he took them out of isolation, they were completely physically and psychologically disturbed in every possible way. And we know that monkeys are a close relative for us. And we know that the worst thing you can do to a person is put them in solitary and take away their connection. So in answer to the second part of your question, the pandemic... The, our response to the pandemic of everyone, you know, lock up and stay home and, and isolate yourselves and quarantine, that had profound effects on our mental health, all of us. Um, and for those of us who were struggling to begin with, with anxiety and depression, uh, and, and for kids who are, you know, struggling with the typical adolescent struggles that are very rough on the psyche, this pandemic had our response to the pandemic had far reaching deleterious effects. And yeah, I think we're going to be spending a lot of years healing and recovering from the isolation piece of it because we need connection. They've done studies that it is more important to connect with other human beings than it is to quit smoking or drinking. In terms of longevity, it's really important. Was there a certain demographic more negatively influenced than another? Hmm. It's it's sort of up for grabs, I think. What in the research thus far, definitely, you know, there's some people who either living alone, you know, was quite difficult for some people, especially if they were more frail. And um, but they've they've definitely found that in most of these things, people with good social supports, even if you could not physically be with your people, like even if it was on Zoom or on the phone or whatever, people who have more social connections and supports weather these kinds of situations better. You know, so it's like, how much did support did you have going in? You tend to weather crises better. That's sort of study after study shows that, um, you know, and I think with the, with the, a lot of people talk about the kids or the teens and, Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a really complicated one because different, I think, different populations of different socioeconomic and regional factors were in there, too. So different populations of kids and teens, you know, had a harder time than some others, you know, so it's a a very um, sort of complex thing to look at. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, our, all of our lifelines were the computer, right? Were the internet mm-hmm. and Zoom. Yeah. If you didn't have access to the computer, and a lot of kids don't, 
then then that's real isolation. I mean, you know, try to imagine having gone through the re- the last two years without being able to talk to anybody on Zoom or on yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if, so if people were struggling beforehand, you know, they're in certain, in, in areas of social support and stability, I think it, it often was a pretty big blow. Got it. Okay. I I would love to, this is such a heavy topic and it's so timely. So I'm so glad this is serendipity that we're bumping Mm -hmm. into each other at this time and we're bringing you to the Flipping 50 community. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you work with groups. If someone is feeling like, okay, these, these are singing my people, these are my people here. And how would they connect? How would they get started in in doing something? Would it be to to buy the book or join a group? What's there for them? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, we think the book is a really uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, marriage of not only the latest research but also the stories of hundreds of anxiety sufferers and their experiences so that we can all find a little piece of our own anxiety experience in that book. That's a, I think a great place to start and that's why we wrote it. Um, but also, I mean, people could listen to our podcast. We've had the privilege of talking to some amazing guests. And then we do once in a while, we do these BFF casts where we just are each other's guests and we talk about things that are our community is bringing up over and over. Um, I just want to throw in there really quickly that even though we call ourselves the anxiety sisters, that's because Mags and I, our experiences as sisters, that's how, you know, we experience the relationship. The truth is, is that the anxiety sisterhood is, it really is just anxiety community. Anyone of any gender with any amount of anxiety is part of our community. And it just, you know, to say anxiety community isn't that catchy, but, but our, so, so that's kind of why we went with anxiety sisters. But so I would say that listening to our podcast, also we have this incredibly active Facebook page. I, you know, it's hard to say good things about Facebook sometimes, but here's one time where I will. And that is that our Facebook page is the, has the warmest, kindest, most supportive and generous people, men and women coming together and sharing their experiences. It's magical. Uh, and we, Maggie and I moderate everything that happens on that page. We do every Tuesday night, we have a book club where we, Mags and I do a Facebook live for the community. There are just, there's great support happening. So if you are looking to connect and not look to spend any money doing it, that is a place to go is our Facebook page. You will meet lots of like-minded people who will all jump in to offer supportive words and kindness whenever you're looking for it. And I just, I can't say enough good stuff about our Facebook page. The people on that page are amazing. I, and want to just summarize again for listeners, you in 2017 launched this community that serves now over 200,000 people. So Mm -hmm. if you're thinking, I don't know, maybe this might be my community. You're not alone. No. Um, so I have to ask you this, and I have to tell you, you need to be careful how you answer. Um, <laughs> is strength training something that you recommend for support of anxiety? It's very pregnant pause here. What's happening, no, no, ladies? No, no, we were just trying to think of the. Um, this is the second month of this year that I've put a little sticker in my calendar saying "Start strength training." <laughs> um, so, through confession, I, uh, I haven't been strength training. So I was trying to figure out if. if I should- um, well, probably yeah, no, but well, one of the things we we do say is that. Well, we really recommend movement. I know Abby and I both have felt that like being able to be out in nature, walking out in nature has been life-saving in so many different ways, physically, Mm -hmm. mentally. Um, And at the same time, we know that at various times in this situ- in the anxi- in anxiety we need various things right mm-hmm. so sometimes there are people who it's not really helpful for me to tell someone go walk in nature if you can't get off your couch because you're so anxious you can't get out of the house because i've been there you know i've been in that place where i can't even keep food down and 
So, you know, doing exercise or strength training was not going to be super helpful because I couldn't get off my couch. Um, so I, I, it really depends on where someone is with what they need. But in general, you know, we know that movement for, for human beings, you know, movement for people ultimately ends up being such an important component of mental health and physical health. But we don't, but we want to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, we're all in different places mm -hmm. and, and not everything's appropriate for every place in this anxiety situation. We always recovery. say one size does not fit all. Truth. Yeah. Truth. But the, the movement, yeah, the movement piece is something that, you know, we've discovered that we need. And certainly we both consider strength training really important for health. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And there's there's quite a bit more emerging research yes. related to mental health, mood, depression, yes. and anxiety. Yes, both. Yeah, absolutely. That, it's absolutely yeah. such a crucial piece, but it uh, we say like you sort of have to be at that fairly functional place sometimes to be able to incorporate that piece. Um, and so we're very also careful that we don't tell anyone like you should do this or you should do that because so many people, you know, we know our experience was this, but also other people tell us this, that so many people have this experience of like, I'm really depressed. Well, go exercise. You'll feel better. I'm really, I'm really anxious. You know, go eat right, exercise this and that. And, and while those things are great, you know, they're not something that we can always do. We know we, we get shoulded if you could mm -hmm. only do this. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could do that, I might not be, you know, <laughs> it's a catch 22 here for some of us. So, you know, we say like small steps and that's why our book has an arsenal of ideas, you know, and movement is one of them. Lots of different kinds of movement is one of them, but we have an arsenal. Fantastic. Because, you know, different things work at different times. Yeah. Meet them where, where they are. Right. Yeah. Where, where you can be, there's no shoulds here. Fantastic answer. Okay, ladies. Well, I have you here. Is there a question that I didn't ask that I should have? Hmm, you actually asked amazing questions. You're such a good interviewer. It's a really know. fun podcast for us. You know, we go on so many and very often the questions are the same over and over. And not that that's a bad thing, but you ask such interesting and intelligent questions. I don't think you missed anything. Well, yeah. okay. Gold I think star. You did a, I think you did an incredible, <laughs> yeah, it was very <laughs> thoughtful questions that you had. In my head right now is that I immediately want to go look up the research on strength training and anxiety. Well, great. Okay, fantastic. And you know somebody who can help you if you need it. Yes, oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Where is the best place for a listener to get more of the Anxiety Sisters? We have a website, www.anxietysisters.com. Www Sorry if I don't put that dot in, Abby gets upset. Um we have our Facebook page. We have Instagram. You know, we're Anxiety Sisters on Facebook. We're the Anxiety Sisters on Instagram. We have a Twitter, but don't don't contact us there because we're <laughs> we're not very good with Twitter. We're only marginally on Twitter. Yeah, we're only marginally on Twitter. <laughs> but if you um, if you either write us an email to abs and mags at anxiety. Well, what do we want? Abs and mags at anxiety sisters dot com, or you private message us on Facebook. Um, I think so. Every email or message we've ever gotten. We it's answer them all. A few days, but we answer every question and every email. So if you would like to chat with us, uh, you have a question or a concern or some feedback, please email us and we will respond to you. We, we will. And if we don't respond to you, you know that somehow it has gotten lost in the in the um, ether, I don't know, what is that? ether. <laughs> yeah, the, the internet world, because we really do respond to everybody. Fantastic. Thank you so much, ladies. Okay, listeners, now it's up to you. If there was a question that you wish I would have asked that I missed, I'd love for you to put that below the show notes. I love to hear from you. That'll be at flipping50.com, all spelled out forward slash midlife dash anxiety. And what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today. Mm -hmm.